All right, one of my favorite parts of pastoring Twin Rivers with Joe is meeting people. But not only meeting people, it's hearing people's stories. I love to hear people's stories. And I've probably talked to thousands of people throughout the years. And from teenager to retiree, they all tell me the same thing, that they're so busy. So let me stop here and say, yes, I know you're busy. I'm busy. We're all busy. But busy doesn't mean that we can't be with God. Actually, you may think busyness is your problem, but I think a hurried heart is your problem. And there's a big difference between being busy and being hurried. Let me show you the difference here. Being busy means you have a full schedule. It's an outward condition. You're running from point A to point B to point C. It's physically demanding, and it reminds me that I need God to finish all the stuff that I have to do every day. A hurried heart is more of an inner, an inner um, condition. It's a preoccupied mind. It's an inner condition of the soul. It's spiritually draining. And it causes me to be unavailable to God. Listen, one of the most powerful truths that I've come to realize is the pace that I'm running at reveals the person that I'm following. Which means that I'm li- if I'm living hurried day in and day out, the person that I'm following isn't Jesus. Listen, one of your spiritual enemy's greatest weapons is hurry. Because he knows that it does nothing for you except leaves you worn out, stressed, full of anxiety, and ultimately like unable to spend your day with God. On the other hand, Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Not hard and heavy and hurried. But we interpret this sometimes as Jesus saying, quit your job, like forget about your responsibilities and go up on a mountaintop and pray three hours a day. Well, that's impossible, right? Like I'm a mom of four. If I am not perpetually cleaning, picking up my house and like doing laundry, we're going to be on the next episode of Hoarders. (laughs) You see, when Jesus said uh, easy, he didn't mean lazy. But if you read the gospels, you'll discover that Jesus was extremely busy but he was never hurried. Just consider in John 21, 25, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were recorded one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Did you catch that? In Jesus' 33 years, he was so productive that if everything that he did was written one by one, The whole world couldn't contain what he did. So he didn't have to choose between being busy and getting all of his stuff done and and having a deep connection with God. He did both. And how did he do that? I think that idea seems so foreign to us and seems impossible, but I believe it's because we've bought into the lies of culture that says you have to choose to be spiritual or be successful. You can't have both. But the mind of Christ says, no, put me first and I'll favor you in all you do. Culture says you have to be self-made, but Christ says, no, abide in me and I'll make you into who you are called to be. Culture says you have, to do, you have to accomplish, you have to work hard, you have to accomplish and make a name for yourself. But Christ says, no, you are my child regardless of what you accomplish, regardless of your status, regardless of your wealth, regardless of your title. You are my child because of the cross of Jesus Christ. So let's put behind us the culture of worry Because regardless of its claims, it's left us nothing but weary and worn out and dissatisfied. So let's, in 2021, pick up the mind of Christ, church. Let's pick up the mind of Christ. I want his wisdom in my situation. I want his voice guiding my steps. I want his perspective for my day. I want his truth as the foundation for my life because it is the only way, the truth, and the life. Let's look at the four ways that Jesus combated a hurried heart. First thing Jesus did, he prioritized a rhythm of rest. Oftentimes we think rest is for the weak. I've even heard ministry leaders say, I'll take a day off when the devil does. But since when did the devil become our role model? Jesus, who saved humanity, prioritized rest. Fatigue comes in many different forms. Mental fatigue, where, I mean, you're just, decision-making is such a chore. 
you're just scrolling hours endlessly because you want a mental rest, you want a mental break. And then, there's a, um, and then there's physical fatigue where you have Red Bulls and coffees all day just to get to the end of the day, right? I mean, I've been there. And then there's soul fatigue, which I believe many of us are experiencing here today and online today. And it's where you feel dead on the inside, where you don't find yourself laughing anymore. You don't find yourself crying anymore. You don't find that the Spirit of God can even move your heart anymore to tears. You feel dead on the inside. And you think, I just need to push through. I just need to get a prescription. I just need to make it another day. But no, friend, what you need to do is prioritize rest. You need to prioritize rest. You see, Jesus doesn't just offer rest. He actually shows us how to do it. In Mark 6, 30, it says, The apostles returned from their mission and gathered around Jesus and told him everything they had done and taught. So the disciples were bragging to Jesus about how busy they were. (laughs) There was such a swirl of activity around Jesus with so many people coming and going that they were unable to even eat a meal. You know you're busy when you can't eat. We forget to eat. So Jesus said to his disciples, come, let's take a break and find a secluded place where you can rest a while. Listen, he knew that the disciples' fruitfulness could not continue if they were fatigued. And his instruction gives us the components that we need to rest. Listen, you need a period of time to rest. You need an hour a day. You need a day a week. You need a week every six months that you can get away You need a place that you can enjoy, that you can go, that can recharge your soul, that you can get away from the demands of life, that you could turn off your phone, that you could just turn off. And most importantly, you need to prioritize the person of Jesus because the kind of rest that I'm talking about doesn't just require a nap. It requires reconnecting with God so he can revive you on the inside. Listen, this is an extremely important point because I know people, they'll take the time, they'll pick the place, but they forget the person of Jesus. So they go on vacation or they go away and they come back and they're still worn out and they're still tired and still weary and discontented on the inside. You have to prioritize the person of Jesus. Take this phone, for example. This device is one of the most incredible pieces of technology ever invented. It can conduct your whole business. It can conduct your life. It can connect you to the world. And its capabilities are limitless. So no matter how intricately this was designed, no matter how many gigabytes of information this phone receives, it's only, at the end of the day, this phone is only as good as its ability to receive power from a tiny little charger. And listen, you're the same way. You've been intricately designed. You're beautifully gifted. You're insanely talented. But you will never become who God wants you to be until you regularly recharge your soul in Jesus. He's the power source of your life. In Isaiah 30, 15, it says, For the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said this, In returning to me. Some of you need to return today and rest. Returning and rest you shall be saved in quietness and confident trust. Not control. But confident trust is your strength. But you were not willing. God is always available to charge your soul. The question is, are you willing Are you willing to schedule and prioritize rest? The second thing Jesus did was he continually communicated with his father. To many, a relationship with God means an hour visit a week on Sundays or a quick prayer or a scripture reading maybe as you're rushing throughout your day. And definitely prayer when trouble pops up. But listen, church, the apex of your Christian experience isn't about occasionally visiting Jesus. It's about continually being in communication and continually being connected with him. And when you learn this, your life will become so much more fruitful and your soul will become so much more satisfied. Listen, that's the way that Jesus lived. 
That's the way Jesus lived. There was no break in his connection with his father. In John 5, 19, it says, Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Listen, prayer is something we misunderstand on so many levels. We think it's about being proper, but really it's about pouring out our hearts. We think it's about having the right words to say. No, some of you guys today, you just need to take this step and lift up your voice. Like lift up your voice. Turn on a praise song. Turn on a, a worship song at least and, and start lifting up your voice to God. The psalmist David says, I'm going to lift up my voice. I'm going to pour out my heart before God. God is really good at being God. He can handle your anger. He can handle all that frustration. He can handle your questions. But you have to lift up your voice. Sometimes that means offering five seconds of thanks just to let him know you're thinking about him. Other times it could be a five-minute prayer or an hour prayer of deep emotion and petition before the Lord. And sometimes it can be just as light as taking in the sunset with the Lord and just acknowledging that he's with you. It's all about threading Jesus through every part of your day, through everything you say, everything you think, everywhere you go. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And I love this because it's a reminder that God meets us right where we are. You know, Joe and I have very different demands and schedules, which means the way that we spend time with God looks very, very different. Like if he wants to, I mean, he could get his coffee, he could pick up his Bible, and he can go to a room in our house or at the office. And for hours, if he wants to, he could shut the door and be in, the, in a quiet spot with the Lord. But me, on the other hand, I can't do that. Like, I never stop. I never sit down. Guys, I can't even go to the bathroom without somebody barging in on me. Like, seriously, I get about three solid minutes a day of quiet time. And the two solid, the two minutes of that three, that's what I'm looking at right there. That's Remy's hand reaching under the door saying, mama, mama, mama. That was taken like three days ago. <laughs> and for so long, I lived in frustration because I would be like, God, how do you expect me to be an effective, like, minister? How do you expect me to be fruitful? How do you expect me to be a good wife and mom if I can't spend time with you like somebody else can that can go behind closed doors and spend some quiet time with, with you? And I had a revelation in John 15 that says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever comes and visits, no, no. Whoever comes and lives and abides in me, and I in him shall produce a large crop of fruit. For apart from me, you can't do anything. The Greek word for abide in this scripture means to hang out, to stay, to remain, meaning God meets me where I'm at. He's just as powerful when I'm unloading that dishwasher, I'm disciplining my kids, or I'm in a carpool line, or I'm cleaning teeth at my office. He's just as powerful in my life in those moments when I can hear him and I can speak to him as he is with someone who can spend hours, maybe not even hours, but at least alone time in a quiet room with him. Listen, God's not frustrated with you. He's not mad at you. He's not disappointed in you. He just wants to be with you. He just wants to spend time with you. He just wants to be with you. He wants to go with you to that ball game. He wants to instruct you in that meeting. He wants to ride with you in the car. He wants to be the, in the totality of your whole existence. Listen, Jesus fought also to be present in every moment. Online campus, say, be present. Type in the chat, be present. If someone were to ask you, what was the greatest moment of your life, what would you say? What comes to mind if I were to ask you, what is the greatest moment of your life? Maybe a wedding day, maybe the birth of your children, whatever it is, I'm sure it's awesome. But I want to let you know that the greatest moment of your life is now because it is the only moment that you have. That's why the psalmist David said, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. 
And do you know, this is actually the way that Jesus lived. Jesus' emotional state always matched where he was. He celebrated at weddings. He enjoyed meals. He laughed with children. He lived in the moment. Listen, he even developed the reputation as someone who was the life of the party. In Luke 7, 34, it says, The son of man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks. And you say, he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. But it wasn't just in the good times. Jesus so disciplined himself that he even cried at funerals, even when he knew there would be a resurrection. Even when Jesus was hanging on the cross and he had every reason to be distracted, Jesus noticed his mom and he looked down and he noticed her and he was full of compassion. And he looked at John and he said, John, take care of my mom like she was your own. Listen, James 1.17 tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from God above. Every small thing, every big thing in your, in your life is an expression of God's incredible love for you. We live in the moment when we see God as the giver of every moment. So when you see beauty through art and nature in a sunset, trace that back to the most beautiful one and worship him. When you see wisdom through a lecture or a book or a conversation, trace that back to the most wise one and worship him. When you see loyalty through a 25 or 30 year employee or a dedicated athlete, trace that back to the most faithful one and worship him. When you see humility in someone holding a door or paying a compliment to someone else or someone's praise of another, trace it back. To the, to the one who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Listen, every time that you wake up, think a thought, have a meal with a friend, that is a generous gift from your father. Those experiences are not random. So let's learn like Jesus to live in the moment. John 10.10 10 says that he came to give life and life more abundantly. All right, the fourth thing Jesus did, he, he served his purpose by serving whoever was in front of him. Now, I believe one of our most defeating mindsets in the church today is that our position has to do, or our purpose has to do with our position, which means that since I'm preaching today, the other 364 days this year, I don't have purpose which is absolutely crazy. No, your purpose is the opportunity and the people that are in front of you every single day. It's just being available to God throughout the day. It's being God conscious enough to see how Jesus would see, hear how he would hear, and respond how he would respond. That's why it was said of Jesus in Acts 10, 38, that God anointed Jesus and he went about doing good. And healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Did you know some of great, Jesus' greatest miracles actually happened on the way to when he, or on where he, when he was on his way to somewhere else? The key is Jesus wasn't so focused on completing the task and just getting to the end of another day that he couldn't see the desperate people that were in front of him. Like you, you know, I often struggle with my purpose. And recognizing my purpose, sometimes I wonder if I have what's in me to just do what God's called me to do. And the other day, I was sitting with a lady here at Twin Rivers, and we were having breakfast together. And I was listening to her story, and her story was one of tragic heartbreak, grief, loss, complete devastation. And she told me that in the, in, uh, during that time of, of that dark place in her life, that someone from Twin Rivers invited her, and she came. And week after week, sermon after sermon, she saw her life. God began to restore her life. God began to heal her heart. God began to transform her mind by the word of God. And I realized, like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in front of a living, breathing miracle. And I heard the enemy say, all you're doing is just listening to her. You're not articulate enough to like lead her or guide her, or give her some spiritual direction. All you're doing is listening to her. And so anyway, she finished her story. It was amazing. 
and beautiful what God's doing in her life. But I got in my car and I was really honest with God and I said, God, I felt so useless. Like all I did was listen. I wasn't articulate enough. I didn't have anything to say back really. I was just in awe. And later that evening I came home and I told Joe everything, like the whole story and how the enemy spoke to me and how I was frustrated because in this season sometimes I don't feel like just because I listen there's any purpose there. And he said, Kayla, everybody else in the world is talking. Everybody else in the world is shouting. When is the last time that you remember somebody really, really took time to listen to you? But when you listen to someone, it reminds them that God is listening. And that's so extremely important today. So listen, your attention is one of the greatest gifts that you can give someone. Every single day, there's somebody in front of you that needs you to stop, see them, hear them, hear their story, listen to them, and remind them that God loves them. Listen, you don't have to preach to them. You just have to be present. A hurried heart will rob you of some of the greatest ministry moments of your life. Determine to seize the opportunity in front of you. Don't be so rushed throughout your day. Let's have the eyes of Jesus and the ears of Jesus that see people in front of, that, that see the people in front of us. Let Jesus say through you, I'm not in a hurry, I'm here. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Hey, what's up guys? We hope that this message you just heard blessed you. To always get our newest messages and to stay up to date, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that bell icon to be notified every time we upload. Now, while you're here, go ahead and check out our page and some other messages we've got and we'll see you next time.